Hello everyone! Season 4 is coming, so before this happens, unless you're watching it later, let's do a quick review of Season 3. Okay, maybe that was a bit too quick. So let's do a quick but not too much review of Season 3. Since there were no major gameplay updates this season, let's begin by quickly going through the major content updates that were brought. First, the obvious thing to happen was the new story chapter, Kanto 5. I won't talk about it too much, but the general consensus seemed to have been that it was the best so far. It can be argued story-wise, but in terms of gameplay and pacing, it was longer and more complete than Kanto 3, while not outlasting its stay like the too many battles of Kanto 4. So I think it was a good balance. It was really that season start, on November 16, for the first three weeks of the season, along the battle pass, as usual. After that, on December 14, came out the Thermir dungeon, actually replacing the old ones. I made a video already about it, but the improvements were really interesting, with the increased focus on ego gifts and buffs, with both a normal and a hard version the week after. And then, the week after again, the first second of the season, Miracle in District 20, giving us a peak of the outskirts. Two weeks afterwards, January 11, while the previous event was still ongoing, the second Walpurgisnacht came out, with new ideas, but especially another type of event, introducing the ordeals, as a direct reference for Lobotomy Corp, with a green ordeal and a long fight. Then we had a period of respite, before facing the new Refraction Railway starting February 1st, welcoming us with hatred and pain for a lot of managers. Then, three more weeks of pains later, the second side count of the season came out to claim their bones, which made it the first season with two side cantos, and it was very low flavored. While for the first one, they made a single stage to farm, more or less painfully, this one had a repeatable dungeon at the end, with unique nodes that could also be found in Mirror Dungeon, including a certain Kurokumo Captain. Both events could give you currency for clearing Mirror Dungeons, which was a boon to reduce the additional farming. The second side canto marked the first anniversary of the game too! Yay! Here's a gift! After that, they delayed the next season for a bit, giving a 5 weeks period of drought for some and of respite for others. As you can see, this season, there rarely was a really dry period. The time between major updates wasn't longer than 3 weeks, except for the last 5 of course. They removed the voice acting for side cantos to be able to produce more of them, but that means that all the content we had was more additional rather than spread thin. It can be argued if it's a good or bad thing, as it gives more life to the game, but can also make the game more time consuming, forcing the players to be more active, and depending on their activity, burn out, but in my opinion it wasn't too much and gave us good expectation for the whole season. Now that major content updates are settled, let's get into the meat of things. IDs and egos. This season, we had a whole 20 IDs added into the game, 7 general ones, 11 seasonal, and 2 Valpurgis, 8 of them being 2 stars and 12 3 stars. Here's the distribution per sinner. Faction-wise, we had our 2 first middle IDs, 3 Pequod crew members, the only twin hook, the third SCCB, 3 Blade Lineage with 1 Kurokumo, as well as 2 Diechi, 2 Leus, 2 Sank, 1 of the new Ophi Association, and 2 more Lobotomy Eagles. Archetype-wise, this was mainly the season of Poise, with more than half of the IDs at least having access to Poise. Among them, 5 IDs were also focused on Bleed, with 3 more being Bleed only. Other archetypes were more or less present, but each with key additions. Burn got 3 of its best IDs, while Sinking got at least one useful new member. Tremor and Rupture got one strong member each. I could include LCCB Rushu in both, but... Uh... And there was... Uh, zero charge! Well, it changes for once. We had also a new form of archetype forming around Resonance this season, the middle and Pequod being key for Envy Res, while Pequod, again, and Blade Lineage form strong pride compositions and Bullet Otis, which with Pequod Discliff ended up being the first IDs having the same scene on several of their attack skills, with the Elmer Sword later. Alright, now for the Egos. We had 6 Egos from the Battle Pass, with 2 General Ones and 3 Seasonal, 
for a total of 11. One Zayin, four Tet, four He, and two Vav, being the first two Vav in the game, or should have, but in between they also reclassified Yi Seng Sen Shower as a Vav 2. The distribution per sinner is as follows. Overall, everyone is getting two Tet and A each, so we'll see who passes the threshold first. Two egos came from already existing Amnos, four Even Scrub and Pagoda Veneration. Battle Pass included egos for Skin Prophet, Hambling Pearl, and Dream Devouring Silk Current. The first event gave us egos for Sandwolf, and the last of the season was from Sign of Roses, but I'll come back to Amnos later. Egos were more mixed in their archetypes. While there were no sinking egos, Burn got the 9 twos, which were also based on Lust Resonance. Bleed got the new Wishing Cairn, who also served Tremor, with the two new Rodion's egos, more or less. Rapture got Garden of Thorns and Onglu's Effervescent Corrosion. Finally, both Blood Obsession filled in Poise and Charge slots, though Don's Wishing Cairn also got a Poise passive. Finally, the early days egos kind of filled all niche, especially Eastcliff's version. While OTC Go was more based on general resonance support, like Gregor's Garden of Thorns. Before we get into rankings, let's quickly mention new abnormalities. This season we got 6 new abnos, 3 in the story, and 3 in Railway 3. The first 3 were already mentioned and were the base for Battle Pass Egos, while the other 3 were only seen in Mirror Dungeon events before, except Outer Blossom Moth, which already had an ego since the start of the game. Now for my season's rankings. I did it in live the week before to discuss it with people, so if you want the full explanation, feel free to check it out. I'll only do a small summary of it. Just for a small explanation, I scored each ID and ego from 1 to 5, each score having a small denomination, which does summarize the score's overall meaning. This was done mainly to adjust the scores I did in my videos after the season has passed. But the tiers have a 0.5 difference, the IDs inside can have a 0.5 variation. The tiers are mostly ordered. Note that the scores are a general one, based on all content, from MD to Railway, or even story or events, and is not used for a mode specifically. Also note that most of them are not fixed in stone and could change depending on circumstances, especially the last ones, or the last one. So without further ado, here are my rankings for season 3 IDs. Overall, the IDs released this season were pretty strong, especially those in the middle of it, with new meta-defining IDs. SCCB Ryoshu was the first ID of the season, and really fell down compared to the others, because of a lack of power and poison consistency. The Blade Lineage IDs all fell flat, outside of Mersoul being one of the strongest IDs ever. But the others just have trouble fully accomplishing their roles, or just lack high value. The HE Sang can do stuff, his only problem being he is compared to Spicebush, which does not prevent him from having good tanking abilities, even if clanky, while Anglo ended up as a strong Unga Bunga. Twin Hug Gregor, while being able to inflict strong damage on skills 3 with his passive, can be clanky to set up to get most benefits, and lacks a passive outside skills 3. Piqua Di Sang, while having amazing potential, does struggle to realize it in most content outside MD, contrary to other Piquod, which, while not fully realizing their potential every time, have more than enough easy conditions, so Heathcliff can be an incredible bruiser, while Ishmael being maybe the strongest support in the game, only brought down by her often annoying sanity conditions. Liu Ryoshu brings higher clashes and damage to the burn archetype compared to the other two stars, and can benefit from burn egos, and Liu Ryoshu brings another strong burn ID, which would be even higher if her passive conditions were easier. The new Ophi Cliff isn't too strong, but while there is no other Tremor Decay, the passive being so strong, he deserves a higher score. Magic Bullet Otis, while having amazing potential, is slower to set up, and has lower utility outside burn comps, though her skills 3 is strong generally. The middle IDs both bring strong tools for Envy Resonance, being the first IDs to capitalize from it, Assault with his strong support and done with high damage potential, mitigated by the need to tank. Lantern Dawn has very high tanking abilities in Rupture comps, while also having high content fiction, just lacking the same potential outside of those. Finally, Sank IDs are both amazing clashers, 
Otis being able to fully fulfill an evade tank roll while Sinclair having great damage. So we're done for the IDs. Now for the Egos. Anglo's Effervescent Corrosion did fall flat with hard conditions, subpar rewards, and unfitting IDs only saved by its high coin value and potential in Glutonate teams. The Rodion's version has way more potential, having strong effects, tremor infliction, free burst, easier conditions, and better passive. For early days, his cliff rewards can be strong, but passive is hard to trigger, and the skills themselves have a higher sanity and sin cost, so compared to Legend Domain, it is disappointing. But this version though does bring a lot more support, with SP heal, high clashing, damage increase, only brought down by passive. Faust 92, while having potential for support damage and setup, requires some burn setup, while having a high gluttony cost, other conditions for attack weight, restraining it from being higher. Meanwhile, Sinclair's, while not doing too much by itself, has better sin cost for burn comps, and especially fits his Encore ID like a glove. Gregor's Garden of Thorns ended up being somewhat average. While having strong general rewards and passive, it is locked behind some more or less undoable conditions and insane sin cost. Dawn's Wishing Cairn being bleed, tremor, and poise gives it utility in different situations, but it becomes somewhat clunky with two specific conditions. Virtue's Blind Obsession is basic, with 3 attack weight, average cost for it, and can bring support where poison charge ideas, also with passive, a corrosion having high potential on low sanity. Ishmael's version is the best ego of the season, with high value, self refund cost, high post support and self charge, strong corrosion, etc. Her passive being okay. Last, Rodion's Pursuance just has strong value and high rolls with her heal, also being able to fill in tremor comps. So that's it for the rankings and for the review overall. In conclusion, while we maybe had the season with the most content event twice for now, it didn't bring too much changes compared to the others. The biggest changes were the IDs and Egos, which gave us some new stables with overall strong options. However, even then, we got less than during Season 2, but maybe it's just them finding their cruising speed. The season was still overall ready filled, with very few dry periods, especially for the story enjoyers, with multiple events and mini episodes. And so, we are saying au revoir to Bon Voyage and heading to season 4, clear all cash. No, 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 not that one. And that concludes this video. Thanks for watching. Final message this also concludes season 3's videos. I'll be streaming Kento 6 stories on Fridays, 6 pm UTC, if you want to check it out. I'll slow down videos in the meantime and I'll see what I'll do next. I'll still continue shorts regularly. Don't hesitate to subscribe and all. But anyway, see you next time, and keep your sanity high in this slow descent into the inferno.